One, two, one, two, three, four. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. It's your host, Sam Jacobs. I'm the founder of the New York Revenue Collective. We've now got revenue collectives in Denver, Boston, and London. Can you believe it? I'm also the Chief Revenue Officer of Behavox. Today, we've got a great interview with a good friend of mine, Rob Lopez, also a member of the New York Revenue Collective and somebody that has helped scale the company just works from zero. He was literally the first sales hire to well on the way to 100 million in ARR. And in the meantime, doing a great job helping small businesses and growing companies with all of the painful HR things that we don't like to deal with, like payroll and benefits, uh, et cetera. So Rob's a great interview and I know him really well, but meantime, we wanna thank our sponsors. So the first is Aircall. Hopefully at this point you know about Aircall, but they are a phone system designed for the modern sales team. They integrate into your CRM, they eliminate data entry, they provide in-call coaching, and they give you the ability to add new lines and minutes. So when it's time to scale, visit aircall.io forward slash sales hacker. That's aircall.io forward slash sales hacker to see why Uber, Dun & Bradstreet, Pipedrive, and thousands of others trust Aircall for their most critical sales conversations. Our second sponsor is Outreach, as usual, the estimable owner of Sales Hacker writ large. That's Outreach.io, the leading sales engagement platform. They triple the productivity of sales teams and empower them to drive predictable and measurable revenue growth. And I just got a demo of the new interface and it looks amazing. A lot of really, really powerful technology, especially on the analytics side with Outreach. So you can sort of have a great purview of what's happening across the sales organization and across the sales development organization specifically. So by prioritizing the right activities, they help you scale customer engagement with intelligent automation and they make your teams, your sales teams and your customer facing teams more effective, improving visibility into what really drives results. That last line being, I I would assume, a reference to analytics. So go over to outreach.io forward slash sales hacker. That is outreach.io forward slash sales hacker to see how thousands of customers, including Cloudera, Glassdoor, Pandora, and Zillow, rely on outreach to deliver higher revenue per sales rep. We also want to thank a few of the fans that have been listening. So Aaron Smith messaged me on LinkedIn, Joseph Adkins, Kirill Melnichenka, Alistair Lane, Connor Casey, Zvika Vogman, Jason Diamato, Jack Davis, all of those folks are listening and giving feedback. Aaron specifically said, what's that song in the intro? Is it Fish? It's not Fish. It's a band called Lipstick. And it's a band that I happened to be in when I was in my 20s. So uh, that's L-I-P-S-T-I-K if you're interested in the music that's playing in the background. But if you're not, that's okay too. Uh, For now, let's listen to our interview with Rob Lopez from JustWorks. Hey, everybody. It's the Sales Hacker Podcast. Welcome to it. It is your friendly neighborhood host, Sam Jacobs, as I'm sure you know at this point. And today, we're really excited to have a good friend of mine on the show and a member of the Revenue Collective, Rob Lopez, is the SVP of sales at JustWorks. And if you know about fast-growing companies in SaaS land, then you probably know about JustWorks. Rob is leading all of their new customer acquisition and go-to-market efforts. He joined the company in 2014 and leads a team of about 150 people across business development, sales, revenue operations, and self-service acquisition. Prior to JustWorks, he served as a GM and managing director at Groupon, helping launch new business verticals, I think specifically in Latin America, and we'll hear about that. And he got his start in finance, at Morgan Stanley and Platinum Equity and earned his degrees from William & Mary and an MBA from Stanford GSB from the business school at Stanford. So, Rob, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. Very excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. So, the first thing that we like to do when we've got a guest on the show is learn a little bit about sort of who you are and your baseball card and, you know, why, uh, why we should be listening to you, why you're a credible expert. So, your name is Rob Lopez. Give us your title once more time. Yes, I'm the Senior Vice President of Sales at JustWorks. And tell us, what is JustWorks? What do, what do you guys do? And, you know, give us a little bit about the revenue range of the company. Just give us an overview of the company for those that don't know. Yeah, so JustWorks, uh, we've been around for about six years now. The business is a all-in-one HR provider. So specifically, we do HR benefits and payroll for growing companies. So companies as small as two employees up to several hundred employees. And what essentially we do is we aggregate all of their outsourced HR services so they can focus on what they do best, which is you know handling their customers, growing their business, 
and trying to focus on that rather than some of the ancillary things that are required, which are the day-to-day like payroll, enrolling in benefits, selecting a provider. So we take that all out of their hands so they can focus on what they do best. How do you frame the revenue range? Is it an ARR number that you quote or? Yeah, so that's more or less what it is. So the, the business is um, like the fifty hundred million dollar range. So uh, I joined the company back in uh, twenty fourteen when we were you know in the, in the thousands, and it's been a it's been a fun ride. But uh, it really, if you think about our business, it's although we sell to a smaller business, it's really an enterprise sale because this is the one of the largest purchasing decisions that a small business owner makes. So I like to to say that it's like an enterprise sale to a smaller business because. If you take into account health insurance and and all the other insurances that a business will purchase from us, you're actually looking sometimes at seven-figure deals. So it's a really, really big decision that companies make. Wow. And so first of all, you know, I think I mentioned it in the introduction, but 150 people across all the different functions. Just give us a sense for sort of the breakout between account executives and SDRs and what are all the different roles that you're overseeing? Yeah, so essentially, I, I oversee all new customer acquisitions. So, one of the businesses there is our account executive organization. That's about seventy-five account executives, regionally, geographically focused. So, everybody's based here in New York, but they're focused on different geos. So, a decent amount of travel to some of the local markets. Then we have about forty people in our sales development organization, and then uh, be business development, smaller, but that's focused on channel partnerships, strategic partnerships. And then we have self-service acquisition. Self-service acquisition is a, is a business which actually is really interesting and we can chat about it a little bit later. But early on in the business, we found that for the smaller customers, we were losing money when account executives were closing those deals just due to the, the revenue that they were paying us. And so a few years ago, we invested in a, a productizing the sales process. And so if you're a two, three-person company just starting out, you can go through the self-service flow, not even talk to anybody and, and able to enroll in JustWorks. And it's become a huge differentiator and competitive advantage for us in the space because no other PEOs or professional employer organizations actually do that. And so it's very, very unique in terms of what we do. And then we have our revenue operations team, which focuses on analytics, process improvements, compensation. And that's been a critical foundation and aspect of us helping to get where we are today. It was actually like after I hired my first account executives, that was the next hire I made because I actually used to run sales ops, revenue ops at a a previous company. And if you don't have the operational background and foundation, you can't scale the business. Yeah. And how big is the revenue ops team now? That team's about 10 people. Oh, wow. And that's 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 across marketing operations as well. Yeah. But still, that's a really nice investment in operational infrastructure. So how did we get here? Walk us through sort of a little bit of your life story. So you, you're from the West Coast. You grew up in LA. How did we end up? And I think, you know, you went to William and Mary. So you, you're highly educated and GSP. Right. How, did we, <laughs> <laughs> how did we go from, from finance to, you know, leading a startup sales team? Yeah, it's funny. Um, so I grew up in LA and my you know, background, like part of my family is from Mexico. Part of my family is like kind of the the typical European mutt. And I always really loved travel. So I studied Spanish and spoke it. And so I always wanted to, to focus on that. And so if you bookmark that, I, I wanted to have different, I'm a big believer in having different experiences. And so I went growing up in LA to moving to Virginia for college. It was like people were churning butter on the corner and, and in Williamsburg, Virginia, it was like the complete antithesis of, of LA, but it gave me a very different perspective on life and the, how much, how important it is to value like diversity and, and different experiences. I uh, then moved back to LA and worked at uh, Platinum Equity, which at the time was a small private equity firm. Now it's a multi-billion dollar firm that uh, you know, they have a massive uh, portfolio, but we were doing what was called business development, which is essentially cold calling CFOs, um, CEOs of small businesses, investment bankers, you name it. And essentially one of the aspects of that so unique, we, were, we weren't essentially selling a product, but we were selling platinum to buy a business. That's really where I cut my teeth and we're essentially sourcing and analyzing new acquisition opportunities for the fund. I then went to Morgan Stanley where I wanted to really gain more of a, a training, but like learn a little bit more about fundamentals of, of sales distribution and uh, worked with some sovereign wealth funds, worked with some large pension funds. And at that point, this was like 2008, so the height of the financial crisis, as you can imagine. There were moments where you'd like go home and I shit you not, you like 
not going in the next day, like, are we going to have a job? Is the company going to exist? Like Lehman was going under. And some mentors of mine, I had always thought about going back to business school and they were like, well, shit, dude, if you're going to go back now, is probably the best time to go to business school. Um, <laughs> so I was like, all right, done. So I basically like hunkered down and just cranked out, took the GMATs and was very fortunate to get into a couple of school, like really good schools. I then did some nonprofit work in South America and like on a whim, I was like, Oh, I'll, I'll apply to Stanford see if it works out. And, uh, you know, I had some scholarships to some other really good schools, but, uh, yeah, I got in there and I was like, all right, well, I'm not going to say no to this and, um, went to school there. And that really kind of changed my trajectory and my outlook. And so I took some classes in finance, took some classes in technology, and I would meet a lot of the finance people and like some of my really good friends work in finance, but you'd meet them and you'd think through what they were, like the type of people they were. And then you'd meet like the founders of North Face and Reed Hastings spoke at one of my classes. And I just looked forward in life and I was like, well, would I rather hang out with like Reed Hastings or like the private equity manager? And I'd much rather hang out with Reed Hastings. So I was like, done. But then I went to the career office and they were like, look, there are two jobs that matter. You can either work. It's like, what are you building and how are you building it? And then how are you getting it to market? Right. And I remember her telling me, she's like, Rob, you're not an engineer. So I was like, all right, done. So I should go work in like the go to market revenue functions of like a growth company. And it was funny at the time I was talking to a bunch of different businesses and uh, because of Spanish and, and that I ended up meeting an alum who worked at Groupon. And at the time the company was just taking off like crazy. And uh, I met the CEO down there and he gave me an offer to run basically sales ops and sales and sales ops and business development for Latin America. And so I got on a plane, moved to Santiago. I'd never been there before. I think I'd been there for like a day. And there it goes. That was essentially like what it was all about. And so I spent the next three years running around Latin America, flying around this country, just doing whatever you could to kind of get the business and grow the business. And we grew that business from when I started about 100 employees to about 2,000 employees over the course of three years, which is an insane experience. And then I found myself in Chicago working for the CEO at the time, launching a new business, which is very similar to Boxed. This is um, Andrew, Andrew Mason? Uh, no, Eric Lovkowski at the okay. time. So I moved back to Chicago for a hot minute. And for the first time in my adult life, I like bought furniture. I was like living out of a box. And then came a call from a former colleague at Groupon who invested in JustWorks. They were seed stage at the time. And I was like, dude, I just literally bought furniture. I bought a bed and I bought a couch. And the last thing I want to do is a job or like move jobs. But Isaac, who started JustWorks, convinced me to fly out for a week. And he's like, hey, worst case scenario, you got a free trip to New York. So I did that. And you know, since then, the rest is history. So it's an amazing story. And one of the parts of it that's amazing from my perspective is just you started at the seed stage and the risk profile of JustWorks at that point is radically different than it is today. <laughs> <laughs> so Very different. Do, Very, very different. Do, you, do you attribute some sort of precognition or prescience? Like, did you always know you were going to get to this point? <laughs> what was your thesis on going to such an early stage company? Well, I think a lot of times if you look at BC, they say, right, one out of 10 businesses succeeds, nine out of 10 fail. I think there's a lot of de-risking you can do. And you can't de-risk it down to 100%, but I think you can de-risk it maybe like 40%, 50%. And I think there's three components specifically that I think about. One is the market, right? So I think a lot of people are starting companies that are going after really small markets. Like they think it's a $10 billion market, but in reality, when you peel back the onion, it's like a ten, like $100 million TAM. And, and I think that there's just an education gap there in terms of what people need to do there. So when I saw the market, you're looking at there's five, six million small businesses in the US and the process was broken. Like if you have ever used an ADP or used one of these companies, they're very monolithic. I mean, they're great. We have a lot of respect for our competitors, but just the way that they speak to customers is very different than the way you need to speak to customers today. And we talk a lot about like, there's this consumerization of the enterprise that's happening. And I really bought into that. And then the second thing was the investors. Like I knew some of the investors personally, they kind of indicated that as long as we built like a really strong product that, you know, they would back us. And the last one is the, the founder. Like, I think if you're working at a high growth technology company, the company needs to be product led. And I think that the founder, there's a lot of people out there that know nothing against kind of people in their twenties starting companies, but there's something to be said for having had previous leadership experiences and, and 
the guy who started JustWorks had been at Amazon, cut his teeth building payment systems, had also had an experience in the army intelligence and had previously sold a company and really had done some pretty remarkable things. And this was his opportunity to build something massive. So I thought that if you could put a great product around this industry, you could build something pretty massive. And they had started the, I think a lot of engineers started a product and it's like, build it and they will come. And then after having a product in market, people realized, oh shit, like they do not come and you need to like sell the product. And that's kind of where I came in. We've been really much off to the races ever since. Were you competing with Zenefits when you joined JustWorks or did that happen like at the same time or just after? Oh, at the exact same time. So I joined JustWorks and then six months later, they raised like the largest Series A in history. It was kind of insane. We probably lost 99 out of every 100 deals to Zenefits at the time wow. because everyone was like, wait a minute, they are free. We have to pay you. Like, why would we ever use JustWorks? Like, Zenefits is free. And I think it's like my mom or like what it is, but it's like nothing good in life is free, right? And it turned out that it was very true with Zenefits and they were doing some things that probably they shouldn't have done. So now we like actually never compete with them. We don't we don't come across them very often. I think just works as a company really built on values. And I think when you're you're trying to scale and build a company, that's really important, right? Like you need to be upfront in the sales process. You need to be honest and like there's shit that quite frankly, in our sales process that you almost like don't, you don't want to like mention too early because it can be challenging. But at the end of the day, the, the what we always teach, it's, it's not a question of if it's a question of when, because it's a long-term relationship that we're getting into. So we might lose a deal two, three times before we win the deal, but we will win the deal. And like, that's kind of the mental psyche and the focus that we really try to instill in our sales process and in our training when we bring people on board. Because we've seen it time and time again, like deals that we've lost two, three, four years ago are now coming on board and they stay with us. I mean, our, our lifetime value just due to the nature of what we sell. It's like, I always talk about, we don't sell screen share software, right? Nothing against Zoom, we use Zoom and you know, we don't sell pens. Like, I think it's great, but you know, it's screen share software. If the screen share software doesn't, doesn't work, like life will go on. Like you will be okay. If your employees don't get paid, like that shit is real. Right. And if you go to the doctor and they don't have your benefits on file, like that is life and that is real. And so we really try to like instill that empathy and that emotional buying process in because this is a really, really important decision for business owners to make. And that goes through and through the DNA from the values, from the way we talk about sales, which I don't really think of like sales and sales. I think of it as like an advisor relationship. And we talk a lot about being a trusted advisor to these companies through educating them about their businesses. And that's really how we try to create the value proposition on the sales side of JustWorks. Um, I love it. And as a free plug, I am a JustWorks customer. And I can attest to the enterprise for small business part because, man, it's it's a pain in the ass signing up for this stuff. I mean, there's a lot of different forms. Oh, so, it's nuts. It's nuts. Yeah. State and federal and, regulation have increased exponentially over the last uh, 10 to 20 years. You guys did a really nice job, and I, every interaction I have with the company is very pleasant. And uh, we get paid on time over here at Behavox, so thank you for that. <laughs> we appreciate that, man. <laughs> so, were you the first salesperson there? I was. I joined as the first salesperson, and at the same time, head of sales. So I was the head of sales of one. So <laughs> it's kind of like playing. I went from running like an 150 person business in Latin America, like a $60 million p and to being a one man shop. <laughs> it wow. was pretty like, it was a tough pill to swallow and like a huge, like, you know, comp change and, and all that kind of stuff. But I really wanted to do something very raw and early stage because at the end of the day, I love building things. Like that's what I love about Groupon. And I think that if you work in this world, you really have to love the building aspect, the tangible aspect of building something meaningful. And like, it's all about the people, you know? And I think that from day one, that's, and you know, quite frankly, what is it? I think I was doing the math the other day, four of the six salespeople that I hired in 2014 are still with us. So I'm, wow. I'm really proud of that. And they're all like doing great things and running teams or doing other aspects of things to the company. What were the big milestones? You know, you, you're dropped in massive culture shock to your point of, you know, going from running 150 people to being the sole person. And you've got a million different things that you could possibly do. How did you start to prioritize and what did you do first? And what were the set of tasks that you did to get this sort of boulder rolling down the hill? 
Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things I initially did was before I even took the job, and I think a lot of people don't do this, is I, I asked to talk to customers. Like, I wanted to talk to customers. I wanted to learn about why did they buy JustWorks? How are they using it? And so that's kind of where I started. Also, when I when I when I did it, I also read the S1. So Trinet is a competitor of ours. Like I read their S1. I read all the S1s of all the companies, the 10Ks, the 10Qs, really understand the industry and the business. And then I got on the phone. You know, we had some anemic inbound lead flow, so made sure I was the one talking to everybody. Started like going through my networks. Who can I? Who do I know that's like that I could potentially transition over? Because if you study the the business life cycle and you go back to kind of like the innovator model, like you have your innovators, you have your early adopters, your fast followers. Like we were selling to the innovators, right? Because we were selling essentially a product that was priced at seventy dollars, sixty seventy dollars per person per month when our competitors were selling free products, right? So we really had to focus on that innovator persona and that somebody who believed that really wanted to support like the New York ecosystem, really wanted to support small business, and really wanted to believe that they could be part of the product development process, which we really allowed them to do. And it's like, look, if you move forward with us, like I can't tell you that we have the best product in market today, but I'll tell you that we will. And really kind of selling the dream and like backing up that dream. And so a lot of those customers we signed up in the early days, they're still customers today, which you know I'm really proud of. And you know, some of them, actually one of them just the other day just raised like their series B of like 20, 30 million bucks and send them an email. It's like, Hey, we really appreciate your business. And it's always like, Hey, it's remarkable that like, we're so proud to be one of your early customers. And so that kind of stuff to me is it's like the people, it's all about the people and the customers. What are the sequences? If you look back at this path from zero to somewhere north of 50 and less than a hundred, are there major milestones that, that you can point to that were sort of inflection points in the curve? So I think that hiring that initial team was was huge. Our first partnership, health insurance is a big component of our product and being able to offer smaller business, small growing businesses, enterprise-like benefits, right? So like Google-like benefits for the 10-person company. They don't have time to deal with putting that together. And so that's what we're all about. So we did our first health insurance partnership at the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. Then we did another one at the end of 2015. And those were massive inflection points in our business where our growth kind of went from 3, 4x and, and really just took off. I think a lot of startups and a lot of growth companies, the biggest error they make is scaling too fast, too quickly. I saw it firsthand at Groupon. And I think one of the big things is you raise 10 million bucks, boom, I want to go to five markets. I want to go to 10 markets. And then since then, I've seen about 20 companies do that. And like now you don't know them and nobody knows them because they don't exist. And so I think it's like, truly like scaling before you have that product market fit. Um, and so we really tried to refine and build our processes. Like New York is the largest city in the country, um, the, one of the largest cities in the world. And we really focused here to refine our systems, refine our process, refine our go-to-market. And until we were ready, which was quite frankly, two years later, we didn't focus a team on any city outside of New York. So we spent like you know, 2014, 2015, and most of 2016 focused on New York and then the next inflection point in our business was when we started focusing teams on other markets. So in 2016, we focused on DC. And then in 2017, we kind of grew that even more. We put teams on Texas and LA and Boston. And now we're kind of really ramping that up with teams focused on Atlanta and a few other markets. So that, for me, that, those are some of the really, really big inflection points um, for us. And, and now we're investing a lot in partnerships, channel partnerships, which has been another one. Is the geographic territory allocation because because you're sending people down to those markets? Is it a legal or state regulation thing? Does it need to be geo based or or we thought a lot about this because some of our competitors do it vertically. But when you think about the compliance nuances and the tax codes and the health insurance dynamics in some of these different markets, this is a unique to our business. But after studying those aspects, like it had to be geo and we made a bet on it, and I believe it's been the right bet. So it really has to do with the local state regulations, because if you're an account executive focused on New York, it's very different than somebody focused on Texas, because Texas has completely different employment laws. They have completely different regulations. They have different health insurance providers that are dominant and competitive. And so for us, that's like the really important component of our go-to-market strategy. Yeah, that's interesting. So the team has grown. I mean, again, just to to make the comment one more time, it's very rare that somebody like joins as the first salesperson and then can make it 
all the, all the distance, at least as far as you've made it so far, which is, you know, most of the way towards a hundred million. What do you attribute that success to? Are there specific skills that you acquired along the way? How do you think about that narrative? Because, because it is so exceptional. Yeah, no, it's really tough and, and, and in full transparency and, and definitely like, uh, it, it wasn't always like there was, I, I had a boss at one point and so that happened, it didn't work out. And so I think that it's really like just, our business is so complicated and unique and at the onset, it's really understanding like the customer buying process and um, like our, our AEs, like ramp takes a while at JustWorks. It really does. Um, and I think that for me, the biggest kind of differentiator why I think kind of it's been, I've been able to do this. I've also run large teams before I've been a part of that process at at another company. And so I think what what you see is rare is kind of joining a company as early as JustWorks was. And I think that that really understanding the customer buying process, the persona of the customers and quite frankly, it like starts with the people, right? Like the culture, it's very interesting. There's so many great products out there, but just because you have the best product doesn't mean you're going to win. Right, it's creating a culture and a winning environment that really differentiates you. It makes people want to work with you. It makes people want to work for you. And I couldn't have done it without my team. And I think that we invested in probably people that were a little bit more senior than you would normally hire at our stage. Um, but it's worked out greatly for us. Um, and you know, over half of our management and directors, they're internally promoted. And I think that that unique aspect of our industry and that competitive knowledge has made it so when people come here, generally, like they want to stay, we're not perfect and, and people do leave just works, but it's, it's trying to build a culture around that. And I think that has been a big differentiator and kind of why you know, I've been successful here. One of the big initiatives that we were talking about is this notion of the JustWorks library. So what is that? Walk us through what that means and how it applies to your business. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. So we, our customers grow over time. Like we have a, a pretty strong kind of net MRR growth. And so one of the things I was thinking about is like, you know, in this day and age, and everybody talks about like a millennial generation, millennial generation, et cetera, and you, you want progression, but at the same time, you also want it to make sense for your business. And so a couple of years ago, I was chatting with one of the guys on a revenue operations team and I was like, well, how can we build a progression plan that, that makes sense? And so what we thought of was, you know, if you could go to the library, there's a bunch of books and we have this thing that we built out internally, which uh, gives an AE every deal they've ever closed over time. And like net of growth, net of churn, like what is that business doing in revenue, net ARR, so net of growth, net of churn. And um, so I thought of this idea about like, what about if you hit different ARR milestones, you could get compensation increases, you can get um, raises, you can get title changes. And I'm a big believer in aligning incentives. And so if the company benefits, then why shouldn't the AE benefit? They actually are the people who brought that business on. They're the person who, you know, has probably nurtured that relationship. You know, the best AE is 50% of their business comes from referrals. And so that's kind of what we've done. And so once a month, we sign out the library when we build revenue. And it's a pretty incredible process because everybody like reads it. It goes to the entire leadership team. It goes to most of the company. And it's like when people hit new milestones, they get like a raise, they get a title change. And it's created this culture of like, I know what the next level is, right? And like, I know what I'm aiming for. And they always, people like in their mind, they know kind of what they need to hit when they, the next level. And so you're always striving for something. And so it's created that like culture of advancement, culture of progression, which I think has been a real benefit for us and has increased and helped with retention overall at the, at the organization. Why do you call it a library? Because it, it's a book, there are a bunch of spreadsheets. So I was like, all right, well, there's books and spreadsheets. Well, if you could go to a library and like open up a book, you could see all the a, like all the AEs and where they they rank in terms of their net ARR over time. And so it just came up with the JustWorks library. Although there are no physical books, so it's like actually <laughs> spreadsheets. It's it's a, it's a reference to the first library at Alexandria. So <laughs> <laughs> so if you hit the milestone, there's no qualitative review. You know, you could be any kind of personality. I mean, I'm assuming you're going to fire the people that aren't aligned with your values. But basically, is there a qualitative or subjective review or the minute that you hit a specific cumulative ARR milestone, you get a so raise? Today, it's just uh, based on ARR. Because to your point, but those other things, we actually like we manage out. And so to date, we haven't 
had the situation where, um, you know, somebody who is an asshole, like <laughs> hits the, you know, senior A or like strategic AE threshold, but it's a good point. And it's actually something that we've been talking about over the last couple of months of, of at certain of the bigger milestones, like putting in a qualitative review where something like a presentation or skills modules, are more complicated deals, because you do get additional things like at the different levels. And so, but it's something that we're thinking about and we're thinking about implementing. How many levels are there? So there are about six levels today. And does that include SDR levels too, or do they have their own levels? So SDR is on a different system. So they're on, they have uh, SDA level one, level two, senior, senior, we call them SDA, so senior sales development associates. So level one, level two, senior SDA. And then once you hit a certain threshold, you can graduate for the sales associate program. And the sales associate program is a three to four month training program, arming you up to be an AE. On average, it takes 12 to 18 months to go through that program. We started it in 2015. We've since had over 30 people graduate through the sales development program. Actually, I think 40% of our AEs roughly came from our sales development program. And they've actually done 30, they do 30% more on average than an external hire with sales experience, which is kind of remarkable wow. when you actually think about it. And these folks, most of them don't have any sales experience. And so are you, are you hiring people right out of, right out of school? Either right out of school or um, a few years out. Now we do hire some experienced folks as well. So they come in at senior SDA, but it's been a huge game changer for us. And I think the thing here, we have the organization, number one, to create opportunity for the company, so qualified pipeline. But number two, it's great opportunity for the reps, right? And it's very tangible. It's very numeric. If you get out, you're able to like graduate from the sales associate program. However, if you don't graduate from the sales associate program, it is an upper out, up out program presently. So that's, I mean, that's another piece as well. So once we get those through though, I mean, it's remarkable. Some of the folks that have graduated, they're a lot of our top performing AEs today. Wow. And they've also like, there's this intangible thing, these externality benefits that you don't think about, like they're much more bought into the company, right? Like they understand the culture, they understand the values. Like if somebody calls them or offering them like 10 K more, like they, it's, they're, they're really focused on it because, you know, we've provided a great platform um, for them and they've given us a lot, which is, you know, why we really want to make sure that, that they're happy and they're growing and they're progressing in their careers. When you're interviewing people or when you're looking at the qualities or attributes of some of the people that really stand out, the top performing reps, what are the things that you're seeing that they do differently versus everybody else? I think the main thing for us, it's, it's around this, there, a big piece of this intellectual curiosity for us. I mean, there's obviously the hard work and I think generally that's a pretty common answer, but for us, it's this like intellectual curiosity and not wanting to give up. So I talk a lot about during the just work sales process, you're going to run into a wall. Like it's going to happen. Like there's going to be a roadblock. And so the, the people who are most successful here are the ones who can think creatively outside of the box and either, are they going to go over the wall? Are they going to go around the wall? Are they going to like punch through the wall? Like how are they going to like get across this roadblock or this wall that this, this block of the sales process? Um, and can they think of creative solutions for this business owner for just works to make sense for them? And, and that to me has been a huge competitive, like the, the people who really excel and the ones who read up on local knowledge and really understand like what's what about our business. And I think those people are the ones that really, really excel. You've been making, and I've always championed sort of really interesting investments, both to stimulate the culture like President's Club and sort of stuff like that. But you've also made some some investments in sort of training and development of the team. And one of them is the mindfulness investment. Tell us a little bit about that, because that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's very unique. And it, I'm really excited. It's a little bit like, I'd say controversial, because I didn't, I never heard of anybody doing it. But one of the women on our team, Amber, she actually ran our strategic accounts program for a while. And she moved over to to run our training and enablement program. And she's like been doing a phenomenal job. And over the summer, we were talking a lot about the sales is, it's very stressful. You know, it's, it's pretty intense for our business, for example, like 40% of our business gets closed in the final months of the year. So it's, it's pretty seasonal and lumpy in nature. And I was, we were thinking through how do we like set sales is also mental, right? Like there are these self-limiting beliefs you have and you get in your head and 
I was reading some articles also around like sports and for example, major league baseball back in the 60s, 70s, mental conditioning didn't exist. And there was this guy, Ken Revisa, who championed mental conditioning and he used to coach Fullerton and actually help work at the Cubs. And now I think all but three teams in major league baseball have full-time mental conditioning coaches on staff. And so I was like thinking more and more about this and, and we were talking about it and we were like, well, what if we like did something about this, right? And like the, the mental side of sales and how do you think through the problems? How do you manage stress? How do you think through mindfulness? And, and so we found this guy who's actually like a licensed therapist, like a family and marriage therapist, but he also does a lot of business coaching. So he wasn't like extremely, he essentially had that, that business knowledge and that business know-how. And we've been working with them. We're about halfway through the program. The classes are you know, usually fully subscribed. People are really excited about it. And it's, it's talking about that softer side of sales that people don't really talk about a lot and acknowledging it's like, Hey, your job is stressful. Like salespeople at pretty much every company. I know our company probably have the hardest job at those companies. You're being told no more than yes. It's tough. You got to pick yourself up a lot. And like, And I think that for us, it was a great investment in the organization to help people think through those challenges and think through that stress and how do you manage it? How do you be mindful about it? How do you acknowledge it? And how do you kind of pick yourself up and work through it? And the feedback's been really strong thus far. And I think it's something that not a lot of people are talking about, but that more need to be talking about. Give us one or two tactics for managing stress that you've gleaned from this mindfulness training. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. I think living in New York City, so I, I've lived in a lot of places, but in New York City, it's like taxis and horns and honking, and it's just a bad morning on the bus or the subway. Somebody shoves you, can like ruin your day, right? And it's taking five minutes, even if it's only five minutes, to like think through and like be present about where you are and what you're doing. And just like on your walk to work, like taking a look around you, like looking at the architecture, appreciating like what you have and really like being positive and thinking through those, those moments. Same thing with like a closed deal, right? It's like, or you lose a deal, like, you know, losing a deal, like that sucks, but like taking a moment and like really being mindful about, all right, so why did that happen? What can I do differently? What can I do better? And also like being thankful and grateful for like the stuff that you do have and trying to like put a positive, like, being in a positive mental state around managing that and managing that stress. Because a lot of times people were racing so much today. There's so many gadgets and so many distractions. And you just, a lot of people just don't take time to just be present and be mindful about their day to day and kind of like what they actually do have. So it's been pretty interesting, like pretty powerful, like bringing in like Freud and some of the like old ancient philosophers around this. And the time commitment hasn't been that crazy, right? It's like an hour and a half every two weeks. So it's not crazy. And I think it's been really powerful. Now, granted, not everybody, we made it optional. Like it was very conscious decision to make it optional because we didn't want to force it upon people. But for the people who are going, at least the initial feedback has been really positive and they're getting a lot out of it. What's this guy's name? Let's give him some more business. Yeah, his name's Lair Torrent. And he actually used to live in New York. He lives in Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> so we fly him up every couple of weeks. And he also does one-on-one sessions with the team. So it's it's not only the mindfulness training, but we thought like do some one-on-one sessions as well. And like, you know, obviously all that's like confidential, like not company doesn't know anything about it, but it's an avenue and an outlet where people can share things with him that, you know, they're, they may not be comfortable sharing with their manager. Right. And I think that that's something that is really important and it just gives people like another outlet uh, because it really is mental, right? There's skills around performance, but it's also, if you're not in the right, like mental state, you're not going to perform, which is why you've seen this increase, the increased utilization of it in professional sports, even in business as well, like coaches and what have you. It makes a lot of sense. And I love the initiative. Moving and switching gears a little bit to just some tactics and some numbers and some dashboards maybe that you're using. What are the sort of top two or three KPIs that you're obviously closed business is one of them. But if you're thinking about before the business is closed, what are the numbers that you're looking at that you rely on to sort of drive your management of the team? For sure. I mean, the, the biggest one for us, at least on the AE side of the, the game, is um, we focus a lot on self-source opportunities. So we have a lot of different demand channels. So we have inbound marketing um, via demand gen that we generate through SEM, SEO, advertising. We have our sales development organization, which is creating SQAs. But I think for the really top performing folks, like self-source opportunities is the biggest indicator of like whether or not you're going to be successful. Because that's 
what you can control, right? I think that, you know, when you fully rely on inbound, you fully rely on another demand channel, you essentially could be in a situation where if that demand channel runs dry, you're sitting in a really tough place. And so we really tried to instill like, look, get to your, try to get to your number using your self-source opportunities and anything beyond that, like if you get an inbound, if you get a sales development lead, like great, that's great. And we really, really have tried to, to push that as much as possible. So that's a really, really big one for us. We also think a lot about, you know, the age of our opportunities. And so because JustWorks is like, a, it's, there's this, I like to call them perceived switching costs. Like a lot of times it's the last thing companies want to think through, but it's one of these things where, you know, the age of pipeline and how much is that pipeline aging over time? We rolled out a Tableau recently, which is like changed the game for us. So we have a central data warehouse, uh, which we call D House, which we plug all of our data into it from our phone system, Salesforce, you name it. And then so we basically will query that data warehouse. So anybody can use anybody can do SQL can like run queries on it, and then we use Tableau to visualize it. And so each manager can basically dig into any KPI they ever want. And it's really changed the game and like helping managers, really giving them, empowering them with the right data and decisions to like run their business. And they can answer any question they want. So like in this zip, how many companies have been contacted and like what's the average like conversion rate in this zip at this size in this industry? What are the customers we've signed up for customer references, et cetera? And so that has been a really, really powerful tool for us. Wow. It's really helpful. When you, so we're getting sort of to the end of our time together. So Rob, thanks so much. But a couple last questions. One is, you mentioned Tableau. What else is in your tech stack? What's sort of the suite or the arsenal of tools that your teams are using to go to market? I mean, it's Salesforce traditional. We use, um, despite the screen share software comment, I, we do like Zoom. So Zoom is good. <laughs> so those are kind of the typical ones. We use SalesLoft. So we're big fans of that. Uh, some of the, the ones probably that aren't as typical are things like Tableau. It's not really like necessarily a sales tool as much. Zoom Info has actually been great for us. Uh, it's the most accurate database that we've been able to find that people can like, that actually has accurate information. Also, beyond that, those are like, I would say the, the main tools. We've looked at some of the intelligent call coaching software. We haven't pulled the trigger on it yet, but some of the, we, we looked at it about a year and a half ago, but it just, the technology wasn't there for us yet. And so we, we sometimes earlier on, we like bought companies that were a little bit earlier stage and then the product kind of craps out. So we're, we're kind of big, believe. we want to wait the, due to the size of our team, we can't roll something out and have it not work because like the credibility factor is just not great. So we beta test everything for at least 30 days now prior to rolling it out. And if we don't feel really good about it, then we just scrap it. Yeah. But intelligent call coaching, coaching, you mean like chorus or uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. Let's pay it forward a little bit. Who, you know, if you're thinking about people that have influenced you or people that you look up to that are other CROs or VPs of sales, uh, walk us through who we should be aware of. Yeah, for sure. So there's this guy, uh, Carlos De La Torre, who has been super helpful just generally. He's great. He actually was this former CRO of MongoDB. Uh, he actually is the uh, CEO of Vera Security now. There's a guy, Jeff Williams, who has been phenomenal. He actually used to run a bunch of sales. He's like IPO two companies, like never missed a quota. The guy is just, you like meet him and it's like he drank 25 coffees in the morning or like <laughs> did other stuff in the morning. You're just like, oh my God, this, I just want to hang out with this guy. And so he helped take FireEye public. He's the operating partner at Bain Capital Ventures. He's really, really smart, really good guy. Somebody you might know, you obviously know Fred Mather. He's fantastic. A lot of insights and, and value there. Wendy Sturgis over at Yax, she's just great. And some more informal mentors, this guy, John Lewis, he was a former president at Nielsen. And Joel Peterson, he was a professor at Stanford. He's a chairman of JetBlue. Mark Leslie, Andy Ratcliffe. Those are some of the people that kind of have given me some really, really valuable advice over the years that has been fantastic. You met Andy at Stanford, must have been. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he was actually a professor there. He was the professor running this company, Aligning Startups with the Market, which is all about product market fit. How do you know when you have it and how do you know when you don't? And that's where Reed Hastings, he had like the CEO of Netflix come by back then. And this was like, this is a while ago. So Netflix was a thing, but nobody actually was using it. And Mark Leslie's also, he ran a, a sales class there 
called basically scaling sales. I forget the exact name of it. And he taught that he, he started Veritas software and wow. really taught, he, he's the one who invented the sales learning curve, which is this you know, academic idea around sales. And so many organizations scale the sales team before they actually have product market fit. And so you hire 20 salespeople because the board and the investors say, Hey, hire salespeople. And then you hire salespeople and then your product stinks and it's shit. And then you have to lay everybody off. And so it's trying to scale that curve prior before you actually have the fit. And I think it's a lot of companies make that error. I see it all the time. Yeah, absolutely. They sure do. Rob, this has been amazing. Are you guys hiring and, or if people want to get in touch with you, a, is that okay? And B, what's the preferred mechanism if they want to reach out, if they like what they heard, or if maybe they want to talk about a job at JustWorks? Yeah, for sure. We, we are definitely hiring. We are hiring uh, in all roles of account executives, sales development. We're actually looking for some great sales leadership, so managers and directors as well. You know, easiest way to email me is just robert at justworks.com. So robert at justworks.com. What was the other question? That's it. That was the only question. That's it, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, we're, we're definitely looking to hire people. I think that it's a super exciting time just for New York and, and the country and just like the, some really awesome business ideas are being started. So I think it's, it's a great way to build a career and really also have some fun meeting some great people while doing it. The wonderful. Well, Rob, thanks so much for participating and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Great. Thanks so much. Hey, everybody. This is Sam's Corner, a great interview with Rob Lopez. You notice, like Dan Cook from Lucid Chart, a background in finance, platinum equity, if you don't know who they are, is, is one of the biggest. And they're specifically middle market and lower middle market private equity firms. I'm sure they have all different strategies, but we work with them when I was at Axial. So a background in finance and then moving into startup land and going to Groupon and then being the very first sales hire. It's very, very rare that somebody can drop in as the first sales hire and have the support of a founder all the way through to the 100 million mark. So it's a fantastic that Rob's been able to do that and weathered a bunch of different storms along the way. And they've put in a lot of really, really great programs. They invest a lot in development. And so one of the things that Rob mentioned is this thing called the JustWorks Library, which is sort of a, a tome, it's a spreadsheet, I guess, of the cumulative ARR, the cumulative contribution of all of the people on the sales team. And they know that when it's circulated, that people that achieve certain milestones immediately get compensation increases and immediately get different types of responsibilities. So I think that's a really interesting approach to this leveling or laddering, career laddering that we always talk about. Uh, JustWorks specifically has six levels just for AEs. And then they've also got a separate program for SDRs. The other thing that, that Rob mentioned, we've been talking a lot about uh, in my circles, what's the average tenure for an SDR? And it's looking like 12 to 18 months is sort of about the amount of time that an SDR can be expected to sort of sit in that role. So develop up a program that takes your SDRs. If you're an SDR, don't get ANSI unless it's been after 12 to 18 months, but develop a program that takes them up through that program and then prepares them to move on to become an account executive. I think 40% of the reps that are at JustWorks now came from the SDR program and they tend to on average contribute 30% more per person when it comes to new ARR. So they're, they're more productive because they're more bought into the culture because they've been developed and because they appreciate the career progression. So really, really valuable insights from Rob and JustWorks itself. As I mentioned, uh, we're a customer over here at Behavox. Great company. Now, if you want to find our podcast on the internet, you can. We're on iTunes or Google Play or Spotify. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share with your peers on LinkedIn, Twitter, or elsewhere. If you want to get in touch with me, find me on Twitter at Sam F. Jacobs or at LinkedIn at LinkedIn.com slash then the word in and then slash Sam F. Jacobs. If you have feedback on guests or recommendations on guests that you want to see appear on the Sales Hacker podcast, please let us know. We want to make sure that the guests represent a great cross section of society, not just white males. So if you have ideas about people that we should be featuring, please let me know. Now, once again, big shout out to our sponsors for this episode, Aircall, your advanced call center software, complete business phone and contact center, 100% natively integrated in to any CRM and Outreach, a customer engagement platform that helps efficiently and effectively engage prospects to drive more pipeline and close more deals. So I'll see you next time. And I think when you're listening to this, it might be near Thanksgiving. So if it is, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving and I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>